Hey, bosses, before we kick off this episode, I want to tell you about our friends over at NetSuite. Now, if your business earns millions or tens of millions of revenue, first of all, congratulations. But second of all, you need to stop what you're doing and take a listen because NetSuite by Oracle has just rolled out the best offer we've ever seen. NetSuite gives you the visibility and control you need to make better decisions faster. And for the first time in NetSuite's 22 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments a full six months for the entire NetSuite implementation. That's no payments and no interest for six months. And you can take advantage of this special financing offer today. It's no interest, no payments. Take advantage of this special financing offer at netsuite.com slash ilab. That's netsuite.com slash I-L-A-B to get the visibility and control you need to weather any storm. One more time, it's netsuite.com slash ilab iLab. All right, let's kick off this episode of Invest Like a Boss. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. I'm Derek Sparks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Welcome back, bosses. Episode 267 here. I got Derek in California. I'm on the other very challenging time zone, uh, ICT. I think we went over this, Derek. Do you remember what ICT stands for? Yeah, it was uh, oh, now you for, in, Indo, Indonesian Central Time. <laughs> Damn, you're all over it, but not quite on the mark. Indochina ah. time zone. Close enough. <laughs> and this is this is the tricky one. This is where we always get into scheduling issues. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually to my advantage for once. So usually it's reverse. It's it's Sam's morning right now, except it's the next day and it's my mm -hmm. night. And usually when we're in reverse here, Sam pops open a bottle of wine and has a drink. So right before we started, I was like, Wait, where's my drink? I, I haven't stocked my bar at the studio yet. So I I have oh. a uh, sparkling water. <laughs> oh, how boring. I that know. would have been the first thing I would have done. <laughs> California, you, you, it's the proximity to so many good wines, man. I know. I need uh, I need some recommendations from you. I might have to pull out your app and uh and try that uh, out. It's it's not it's not hard, man. Just go to the grocery store and buy a fifty dollar bottle of Napa Cab and you can't miss. <laughs> All right, it will do. <laughs> it's like they're gonna be better than any wines you have anywhere else. That's a good point. And I don't I don't even know exactly where you are, Sam. I what I do is when I when I do these time zones, I was like, well, I think he might be in Thailand. So I do like there's like site I just Google all the time that's like tell me the time in two different cities. I assumed somewhere in Thailand. I, you should update people in the last month. Where have you been? Because uh, I don't think you've been on for a few weeks. Uh, yeah, man, I've been I've been running around quite a bit. It's been a good trip so far, but uh, yeah, it's went from Japan for almost three weeks. I was up in the north, Naseko, uh, skiing up there with with Kevin Shea. Then I went down to Phuket for two and a half weeks, and now I'm back up in. Bangkok um, for at least a week, and I'm supposed to return to to Japan for a month by myself. I'm actually kind of scared. It's a long time. Oh, that is <laughs> scary. Are friends. you going to be like in a city? Or are you kind of going to the mountains again? What's the plan? <sighs> I have a very romantic trip for one person planned to Kyoto <laughs> to see the cherry blossoms. Sounds ridiculous, and I, I think this. Oh no, this does not sound ridiculous because. Your mission now is to find some mushrooms and watch the cherry blossoms. That is the plan, oh, Sam. <laughs> I think um, I think I'm just going to take the natural route to seeing the <laughs> cherry blossom. So right now, sitting in, sitting in Bangkok, a uh, couple weeks in Phuket was really interesting. Actually, we got an episode coming up in might be might be the week after this that is going to compare Bali and Phuket property prices and what's happening right now with the major, major invasion. And I'm not talking invasion into Ukraine, but it does go in parallel. It's the invasion in Phuket and Bali of, um, you know, people from all over the world, but primarily Russian. And so property prices are soaring. You said it looks like a, like a Russian city almost over there. It's, it's little Russia. 
It's Little Russia. All the signs, all the restaurants, all the menus have all been translated into Russia. I don't think there's a villa available in Phuket for the next three months. Sounds ridiculous, but it's it's crazy and it's true. So uh, lots to talk about there. So yeah, we'll have an episode coming on on that soon. I'm going to go meet Johnny in person to record some commentary for that episode. So looking forward to that also. Oh, exciting. Uh, we don't get to see each other very often. I think a lot of people think that, you know, we cross paths a lot, but this is this recording over Zoom is like the closest we get to each other a lot of times. So that'll be Normally a cool episode. We be further in the world apart from each other. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we, there's got to be some kind of podcast a record of like the distance apart from all the hosts and we got to have it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, the, on this episode, we're going to talk about getting a little bit further away from Earth. I was introduced to this guy, Jose, actually through one of our listeners. And Jose runs a company called Zero to Infinity. And it's we're talking space tourism here, man. What an exciting topic. Of course, something that's new to Invest Like a Boss that we haven't touched on. And Jose is local to Barcelona. He grew up in Spain. He's been running this company for over a decade. It's super exciting. And when I heard about it, I'm like, Dude, we have to have an episode on space tourism and what they're doing. I actually had a failed attempt to record this, <laughs> no <laughs> surprise, with uh, running around with a, a digital or with a remote microphone setup that failed. So happy uh, Derek was able to record this in his professional setup. So Derek, thanks for thanks for taking the lead on this one. What, what are you going to talk about with Jose on the episode? Well, I was I was actually really intimidated to take this because. I don't know a whole lot about space. So um, you, you were like, hey, uh, so we had some technical issues and then we, you know, we tried to reschedule and you're on the other side of the world. He's on the other side of the world. So I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll hop in and take this one for Sam. But <laughs> no, actually, but I'm, I'm, I'm really glad I did. Uh, his name is, is Jose uh, Mariano Lopez Erdialis. He's the founder and CEO of Zero to Infinity. And he has an idea that's different. This, is, this isn't Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and Battle of the Billionaires going to space. They utilize a completely different style, a completely different design. This is leisurely space travel. This isn't go up for five minutes in a rocket full of fuel and explosives behind you. This is casual space. And we're talking good company that they're with here. As Derek already mentioned, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, Blue Horizon, they're the predominant players in effectively this race to space tourism, but Jose is doing something much different. I think it's going to appeal to way more people. So not only is this episode going to be cool to listen to and kind of get informed about space tourism and where, where everything stands, but this is also an investment opportunity that I think if you're in a position, this could be super, super intriguing to be part of. So let's hear Jose and Derek on this interview. And then uh, Derek, looking forward to hearing, hearing your commentary afterwards. All right, let's do it. This week's sponsor of Invest Like a Boss is NetSuite by Oracle. Now, we know we have a lot of bosses out there with their own business, and many of you are earning millions or even tens of millions in revenue. And if you fall into that category, you need to stop everything you're doing right now because NetSuite by Oracle has just rolled out the best offer we've ever seen. For the first time in NetSuite's 22-year history as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments for a full NetSuite implementation for six months. That's no payments and no interest for six months. NetSuite is number one because they give your business everything you need in real time, all in one place to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity across every department. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control of their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. So take advantage of this special financing offer today. It is unprecedented. No interest, no payments. When you head to netsuite.com slash iLab, that's netsuite, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot -E com slash iLab, I-L-A-B. You'll get visibility and control of everything your business needs to weather any storm. Check out netsuite.com slash iLab. Okay, I'm here with Jose from Zero to Infinity. This is 
a really cool topic. I mean, I, I like all of our episodes, but when we can talk about going to space, it gets me really excited. And Jose has a company that I think can get us all to space pretty soon. I, at least that's the hope. Uh, thanks for coming on Invest Like a Boss. Sure, Derek. Happy to be here. And I, and I know our listeners can't see it, but I'm looking at Jose. He's got this really cool picture in the background. It's the whole curvature of the earth and the sun. And it's actually a photo that was taken on one of his crafts from zero to infinity. You want to tell us about that maybe quick? Yeah, this, this is a flight of uh, a pressurized pod. So inside you would feel comfortable like a shirt sleeve environment that we flew to about 32 kilometers altitude, which is about three times as high as an airliner. And you up there, you get to see that the Earth is effectively blue and round, unlike some, what some people like to say on the Internet. Um, yeah, uh, so that's a, a real vehicle that we've flown up there um, so that eventually we'll be able to show to people that, yeah, this kind of view that only astronauts have had until now. Yeah, it looks amazing. Like, I, it literally looks like you're as high as you see on the movies or, or any other kind of NASA footage. It's it's way, way up there. Before we get into all that, and I hope you can break it down into some more like non-technical terms because I'm by no means an expert on space and I don't think uh, most of our listeners are either. But the whole concept of going to space is really exciting and I think something that we all want to learn more about. Mm -hmm. Why don't you first tell us about your company, uh, Zero to Infinity, and where did you start and what's the goals going forward? So uh, to, to really understand where I'm coming from, why I started Zero to Infinity, we have to go way back uh, when, when I was uh, a little boy, because my dad is an astronomer and he would be launching rockets, balloons, working with the Soviet Union, working with the US, with everybody, trying to understand uh, our atmosphere, our planet, other planets. So I grew up in an environment where at the dinner table we would talk about different technologies and different solutions. And then uh, when I when I became older and I got a you know I got a degree at MIT and started working at allegedly fancy places like the European Space Agency <laughs> or Boeing Phantom Works, allegedly is the key word there. I saw that no, there is a lot of copy paste. There, there isn't an incentive for real progress, and you need to start from a private company. It can be ours. It could be others. But it's not going to happen by waiting. So, so that's where the impetus of Zero to Infinity is coming from. It's from seeing that there's so much potential in space and it's not being exploited and we have to make it easier for folks to, to get up there. I'm really glad you brought that up because that brings me into my next question. I, I was just thinking about space overall. Man first went to the moon in 1969. It was over 50 years ago now. And I guess you can't really think of any other major milestone where humans have gone somewhere that really nothing that we hadn't done before. The moon was kind of that place that was like, that's, that's impossible. And then we did it. And I feel like, you know, it was kind of, I guess you could call it the, the U S versus Soviet union type thing going on. Then it was a huge competition. And then it felt like, you know, obviously we made a ton of innovations. I'm sure you could name countless ones in space. But as far as that real headline grabbing thing to get humans out into space, it hasn't really occurred until the last couple of years. And I think that's where you come in with the whole private companies jumping into the space business because, you know, before it was it was NASA or it was a government agency. And as we've seen their funding get cut, um, I think we've seen a lot of private money go into other companies. What's the reasoning for this? And is it that the government's got lazy and we didn't have really any ambition to do other things in space and now um, the private sector has taken over? Well, I, there are like three distinct phases to spaceflight, and the same can be true for other big, big, you know, capital intensive, initially capital intensive activities. There's the first when it's only governments that fund it, and are actually only hyper governments like, okay, empires like NASA or the, the Soviet Union, and that's it. And then, then little, uh, more um, mid sized countries like, say, France or Israel or Japan start getting some capabilities. And, and now we are in the phase that. You know, we're past the government program phase and we are now in the in the billion, what I like to call the billionaires phase. So we have billionaires. Mm -hmm. We used to have the late um, co-founder of Microsoft that um, that was uh, really, really one of the first ones. Most people always think about Bezos and Branson and, 
and and Musk, of course, but but uh, Paul Allen was really the one that started doing this kind of thing. So the, all these billionaires, they have projects that are amazing, but they are in a way a little bit of a pet projects. In a way. I mean, they they are very very heavily designed towards the aims of the particular person. If they want to fly themselves, or if they want to die on Mars but not on impact, or you know, have an industry become uh, multi planetary or what else. Uh, of or of world um, and that's the second phase and it's the phase where we are now and it's it's similar if you think of computers in the beginning computers were only owned by big governments okay there may be five in the world uh, and then there were some corporations and some evil genius billionaire that would have a computer and would show up like on a on a James Bond movie in the <laughs> 60s or something like that and now everybody's got a computer because it's competitive. And that is the interesting phase. We're transitioning from the billionaire phase, we left past the big government phase, we're in the billionaire phase, but it's gonna be a new phase where anybody with a better widget, anybody with a better solution can find capital, can service the market and, and can make it big and, and, and offer utility to folks that want to send their things up there or want to go themselves up there. And that is this interesting transition that is taking place right now for many reasons. Uh, part is what you said, that the, the, the government programs tend to just perpetuate themselves without much of a, of a goal. I mean, once, once you beat the Soviets to the moon, what, what, what is it next for you? I mean, what, you don't have any incentive to, to do anything because you already beat them, right? right. So you, you, you need other incentives. And the, the strongest incentive by far, more than connecting the unconnected, more than better understanding the planet or the weather or natural resources or the environment, the biggest, biggest, biggest market, although it's mostly untapped, is leisure. Right. And this is what makes it very fun. And when you look at anything, it's like that. This sounds a bit uh, out there, but when you look at, let's say, computers, what's the big market of computers? Is it government computers? Is it military computers? No, it's games and content and leisure. And when you get to that point, that's when it gets interesting business-wise. And this is going to happen to space very, very soon. And, and yeah, and I think it feels oh, so much more attainable than something like Elon Musk has been trying to do and try to go to Mars and, and live on Mars. I personally, I have zero interest in going to Mars. <laughs> I, I I don't want to go there. I can't breathe there. What am I going to do there? But if you say uh, you want to send me out into space so I could view the world, that sounds amazing and way more attainable. Yes. And you see, um, because of this fact that, that there's been this billionaire phase, they jumped a few steps along the way. You know, historically, and I don't want to get too, too boring with this, but historically, if you, if, you, if you ask yourself, who are the first people to say this? Who are the first people to say, wow, it's really round. It's, wow, the earth is blue. It's so beautiful. And I can't see borders. And the sky is black during the day. And you can see stars and planets during the day. First people that saw all that were balloonists. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> they were people flying up on balloons way before the Second World War, uh, mostly in Europe. And by funding these big rocket things, all these programs, they are skipping that phase. And actually, if you want to scale a program where you want to offer hundreds of thousands of people and eventually millions of people, the view of the planet, you don't really need a rocket at all for that. And that's where we come in. We're reaching the altitudes where you get the view and not higher using balloons uh, instead of rockets. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about that because I, from the way I read it from your website is you actually have two different segments to your business. You do actually do have a rocket launching portion, correct? So you can you can launch satellites, um, yes. it, whatever matter it may be. And then the, the second part would be more the space tourism side with balloons. Now, I don't know of anybody else using balloons. Uh, you said, you know, those were the pioneers pioneers of essentially space travel back in the day. Yeah. Um, is there anyone else out there using this balloon concept? And, and what does it look like? Does it look kind of like a, a hot air balloon or kind of explain what it looks like? You know, I wrote a paper in 2000 and another one in 2002, and I was the first person proposing high altitude balloons uh, for space tourism. And since then, way before starting the company, seven years before, and since then, this has this paper and our work has inspired a bunch of people to try to do the same thing around the world. None of them have a picture like this one in the back. Okay, so, but there, <laughs> of course, of course, they're attracting investment, and it makes sense that 
competition is healthy. What does it actually What does it actually look like? Oh yeah, well, if it looks like yeah, that's right. If it looks so, it looks like very much like the Chinese spy balloon that they shut down recently. Over. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up too. I want to talk about that. Yeah, so <laughs> it looks like that. It looks like semi-transparent, whitish. Uh, the balloon is like that, and then underneath there is a totally UFO-like. Pod. We have a patent on that and has big w- windows like this one here behind me. So it has big o- oval uh, windows uh, or sort of ellipsoidal windows so that you see all the, your fields of view is, is outside. So you can see outside perfectly well without seeing the edges of the rim of the window. Uh, it sees four passengers and two pilots and you can walk around, you can have dinner, go to the restroom, join the 20 mile high club. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we thought of everything cook, write a poem, have a, a board meeting with a global perspective. I mean, the possibilities are really endless and it's the customers that are going to set that, them up or, or do experiments. And, you know, if, if you think uh, you were saying before about what was something that caught the public's imagination and like excited people beyond Apollo, I have to say that the next thing that did that was the Red Bull Stratus flight when the Red Bull right. did an amazing campaign and they had Felix von Gatton skydive from the edge of space. And he dropped out. Yep, I remember that. And what did they use? Did, did Red Bull have the budget to build a badass rocket to reach there? Of course they did. They had two freaking Formula One teams. Of course they could have. Would have been smart for them to build a rocket and open the, the door of the, the, the hatch of the rocket and have the guys cut out from the rocket? No, it would have been dumb. <laughs> because <laughs> it would have been more worrisome and more dangerous just the ride up on the rocket than the actual skydive. Mm-hmm. If you So they prove the point very easily that if you're smart and you just want to get that shot, that money shot of the view and that, that experience of seeing the planet, you absolutely don't need any rocket. You, the rocket just adds risk, complexity, sometimes environmental hazards, but the balloon can get you there high enough. And the thing is, the curvature of the Earth uh, from one of these balloons looks almost the same as from orbit. The change is, is tiny. It's almost negligible. Once you see it's a little bit bent, it's bent. You don't care if it's 15 degrees or 31 degrees. Who cares? Right. And we're, we'll post pictures and some video of, of some of the flights as well. But just even looking at the picture behind Jose right now, it, it looks like you're deep into space. It's it's very, very cool. This this kind of reminds me of, you know, obviously after the Hindenburg disaster back in the, in the was it the 30s that, yeah. you know, the, the way of the Zeppelin went away. But this is, this is kind of akin to sitting on an airplane. Everyone's been on an airplane. It's uncomfortable. It's awful. Even if you get first class today, at least in America, it's not that great. But if you look at those old um, videos of like Zeppelins, people are having dinner, you know, walking around casual. This is kind of akin to that. You can you can just relax while you're in a balloon. I don't think I could relax in a rocket. No, it, it would be very nerve wracking. And of course, if what you want is that, if you want the adrenaline, by all means, go for it. But you can get similar experiences on fighter jets, you know, the accelerations and all this for a tiny fraction of the cost. Our approach is is really about the experience, being comfortable and not being only for the space cadets. You know, some people like want to collect, okay, I did this, I survived this, I'm I'm a, an adventurer. Okay, adventurers are awesome. Yeah. They, but we want to we want to attract conservative folks that one day are doing the flight with us the other day they're I don't know, going to watch, uh, you know, uh, a movie with a movie director or they're visiting some place with the Dalai Lama or I don't know, or going to the Titanic on a sub. The thing is, the amount of experiences that our world offers is amazing. And we have to open up space initially to those that can afford and have curiosity for those experiences. And that will fund the development of even more affordable solutions. Mm -hmm. And this is unstoppable. And that's how you change things. You know, if you are just making something tailored to the vision of the particular billionaire that is putting the capital of the project, that's not going to attract that many people compared to something that is tailored to everyone. I always, you know, when I talk to designers or marketing people, I always think, Okay, think of, I don't know, your grandmother or your mother-in-law or somebody like that. How are you going to get her to fly? Because that's my target. I know already that the high D folks that just want to break everything, they all want to go, of course. But you have to make it feel safe, right? charming, meaningful. That's very important. All of our flights have scientific equipment on board that helps better understand the planet. And they have 
zero environmental impact. And the thing is that it also makes them safer <laughs> because we are not, instead of the Hindenburg, you know, by contrast, we're using helium. And helium is a noble gas, and it may change your voice, but it does nothing to the environment. There is no <laughs> sure. way it can chemically react with anything because it's just an inert gas. So that makes it very, very safe because it can't explode or anything because it can't react. There is no chemical reaction, but also very uh, environmentally friendly because for the same reason, it doesn't react with anything in the atmosphere, has no effect there. So it's like there was nothing. And that uh, that's critical for scaling, you know. It's interesting you use helium. Am I correct that I feel like a few years ago there was some kind of helium shortage? Was that the case? Yes, there are some helium shortages from time to time and crunches. This has nothing to do with running out of helium or anything like that. But okay, production. The disparity between offer and demand. Yeah, you know, I, I get this a lot, especially from environmentalist types. They're like, oh, but helium is not renewable. And uh, just a couple of things about helium. helium. The earth is constantly making helium through natural radioactivity. And uh, most of it is not economically uh, effective to drill and extract from the ground. So... The, most of the helium is just too expensive to get it out. It's never We're never going to run out of helium. It, it's just going to increase the price, maybe. That's it. Many things are like that, you know? Gotcha. So f forgive me if this is another dumb question. I guess what I see from space is what you see in the movies. Um, when they, when they hop in a rocket, you know, let's say they're, they're going out in, in, out into orbit and on the way they're going to the atmosphere. Now in the movies, this is probably wrong, but it's hot. There's fire going over. There's heat everywhere. Is it actually that hot in the atmosphere? And how far into that do you go? Because you have to have some kind of heat resistance, I assume. All right. Good, good point. Uh, they, there is a tremendous heat and that would melt uh, almost any metal. Uh, but that heat is only because of the speed. It's not something about the atmosphere itself. It's like if you are going up or down at huge speeds, then the air gets compressed, the shock wave in front of you, and that compression of the air heats it up to crazy temperatures, like like the surface of the sun in some okay. cases. So that is true, but that is only because you're going very, very fast. The thing is, our balloon never even gets supersonic. So there is no re-entry heating. There is no risk like that. It's just uh, like you can put the outside is basically cold <laughs> because it's very cold up there, but that's it. There is no fireball or anything like that. They, you do get those kinds of things on the rockets okay. because they go very fast. The thing is, look, most of the, most of the rocket technology comes from me missile development. The main concern of the Soviet Union and of everybody else that has been building rockets here and there has always been uh, launching a warhead to the other side of the world with enough precision and fast enough so that I can kill them before they kill me. That is being used now to launch satellites and to send space tourists, but it wasn't meant for that. Like when you are applying a tool that has been developed for something completely different, like okay, the end of the world, what makes you think that that's the right tool for the new markets, such as putting sat telecommunication satellites or, or offering uh, rights uh, for scientists and explorers into space? Doesn't make sense. Balloons stopped being used because they were not good for this uh, military mission. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why. That's why they have sort of been abandoned. But now that there are commercial demand for these things and, and drivers, they, they're coming back. Well, maybe maybe one country is still using it for military missions. Debatable. We had the recent uh, Chinese balloon here <laughs> in the United States. We still never really got a clear answer on what they were doing, what it was. There's all kinds of crazy theories. I'm not going to get into that. But you said your <laughs> balloon looks something similar to that. So I had a yeah. question on a related note. How do airspace restrictions work? Where are you able to fly? Is there a certain height that you could fly over, let's say the United States, without it drawing attention, or any other country for that matter, without worrying about military interference? So when we fly, we demand permission to cross the airspace. And that's on the way up, on the, on the way down. Once you are above airspace, once you are above where airplanes fly, you can almost do anything that you want. And that was sort of the situation of the, of the Chinese probe. So it's sort of like it's sort of like uh, the sea, I guess. There's a certain point where it's just international waters. Is there just international um, airspace and anything kind of goes? Uh, there's some big gritty. And that's for, okay. uh, for reasons. So governments have been 
mostly the Soviet Union today and the U.S. have been reluctant to provide a limit. But in practical matters, anything above where air traffic controllers can see, which is about 60,000 feet, that's outside controller space. So there's a term in the Pentagon, which is near space, and we use that too, which is anything above where airplanes fly and below orbit. Okay. And that's where both the suborbital rocket rides and our balloons and some strange uh, drones like the Zephyr, well, now it's called Alto from Airbus fly. There are a few devices and some classified programs also. A few devices that can fly over there, but um, it's the most unexploited uh, part of uh, the column of, of air that we have. And the air there is extremely thin. It's almost vacuum. Like visually, you can't see it. You can't. It, it's like you are seeing into space. But there is a tiny bit of air, otherwise the balloon wouldn't stay. But it's just uh, negligible for the view. Oh, that's a good point. If you were actually out of the entire atmosphere of the Earth, the balloon could no longer fly. But the truth is that the atmosphere of the air reaches almost all the way to the moon. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. It's just that it's an exponential and it depends for what reason. That's why satellites re-enter. That's why satellites go into spiral and re-enter because they have some drag from the atmosphere. There is always some mad air. There's, there's uh, even some hydrogen around the Earth, <laughs> very, very high up, uh, thousands of kilometers up. So the thing is, the, um, the limit of the atmosphere only makes sense for what application? Like, because there is almost no limit. Uh, I mean, you can still find particles even if you go towards the sun. So we go about 99.8% of the atmosphere <laughs> okay. in terms of mass. So if, if that's not enough, uh, well then they need to go for higher. But like <laughs> for the customer, they, they don't really care. They just want this view. Yeah, and I'm curious now that, you know, as the years go on, there's more and more objects in the sky. Obviously, you know, with radar, you can figure out where planes are, how to avoid them, uh, things of that matter. Is is there a potential situation where, you know, you could run into low-level satellites? Um, how many things are really flying in the air? I mean, I think there's a lot more than most people realize. Oh, there, there are many, many thousands on the, uh, and it's becoming a little bit crowded. Sometimes satellites have to be moved uh, on, to avoid risks of collision. Uh, but in the area that we fly, there are very few because you can't really have a satellite that low. So for a satellite to really stay around the Earth and spin around the Earth, it has to be where the air is even thinner than us, like okay. much thinner. So it has to be like 150, 200 kilometers for it to make a complete turn around the Earth. Uh, it really depends also on the on where the satellite is made. If you have like a cannonball made of uh, of lead, that's gonna be able to 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 stay longer and and do a trip at, or even at a lower altitude than if you have let's say a satellite that is just a thin solar panel that is flying against the the, the wind in a way against the the air. That that's gonna fall very very quickly because the ballistics are are different. But in our area, you can't really stay. It's not very crowded not very congested. Uh, it, it, there's really a lot of room for, for more devices up there, more missions. Gotcha. So um, how many flights have you actually uh, done on the balloon? Have you actually taken up any tourists in there or is it all internal people so far? No, no. We've done over 50 flights and we, we haven't yet taken a human being up there, right. believe it or not. Uh, we've only taken uh, robots and sensors and cameras. And mm, the reason why we haven't taken a human yet is is very simple. It's it's uh, it, we've struggled with funding, mm -hmm. even though we were the first doing this. Even though we've seen people fundraise uh, crazy amounts of money, way more than what you need to really take tourists. Uh, we we've never had the cash in the bank to send a human being safely. And the, word key, the key word here is safely. We are not interested in taking crazy risks, unnecessary risks. The industry is very young. There are already enough players out there having accidents, explosions, and making a mess that we don't want to be one of those. So if we're going to take a person up, it's going to be with all the guarantees, extremely safe, safer than the taxi ride you know, to the airport. Uh, Otherwise, we're not. We're we're gonna stay just flying cameras and things, and hopefully we'll fundraise. Maybe from this from this podcast, there's gonna be someone that wants to chip in. You're invited. I know we got a boss or two that definitely wants to go to space, so I hope we can make that happen. And as far as yeah. where these uh, balloon crafts are at this current moment, let's say you got 
all the funding you needed tomorrow is do you do you have someone ready trained to go is the aircraft even able to be flown by a human because obviously you're controlling them remotely right now is the def is like the actual model for the craft ready to go or are you still developing that part too Oh no, it's it's been ready for for years. You see, uh, we are very careful in our what we call our technology roadmap to only include things that are brick and mortar. Only include things that you can buy and integrate. If you know what you're doing, you just buy them, put them together, and fly. So, for a first human flight where the sky is black, it would take less than twelve months, probably around nine months. And for the first tourist flight, that's a different story because it's not the same thing to put a test pilot that knows what you're doing than to put somebody that is a uh, First, I've just got maybe a couple of days of briefing before the flight. For that, we're, we're going to need in total about 24 months. What do you need? What's the difference? How, how do the certification agencies, the people that control the airspace and such, they, how, how do they know if it's safe to fly a human that is tourist or not? Well, basically, to simplify things, the, if you've done 10 flawless flights, then statistically it means that it's, it's, it works. <laughs> right. So you can start charging people to fly and with little training. And that is exactly what uh, our friends at Blue Origin did with the rocket. They did, I think, 12 or so perfect flawless flights. And then, then that's when Jeff Bezos and his brother flew up because it had been proven to be uh, to be safe. Of course, the funds that are required to build that craft and test it ten times perfectly are a couple of orders of magnitude more than the ones that we need with our balloon. But that's um, yeah, it helps having the the richest guy in the world behind it as well. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely it does. Yeah, but one fun question while we're here: so Jeff Bezos was one of the first people to go up in in the Blue Origin craft. Interesting enough, as of this recording, at least Elon Musk has not gone up in a SpaceX craft. So, are you going to be right. one of the first ones to go up in yours when you're ready? Oh yeah, yeah, I I have my suit ready. Actually, um, uh, because we will be using pressure suits for the first flights, mm -hmm. unlike because it's safer. Unlike other folks, uh, we 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 will do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm so looking forward to it. But of course, it won't be on the first. Maybe it will be third or fourth, or something like that. Sure. Uh, because because I don't want to bother the professionals that are doing their job. You can't have the boss sense. sitting next to you the whole time. You know, <laughs> make you nervous. <laughs> that, that's right. I, I will be a, a sort of a boss ballast kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually. Uh, the hope is you you wouldn't need the pressure suits either, right? You, I could just Correct. go That's like just this. for the first test flights because it makes sense to take every precaution. Just like when there's like a new sort of car that goes into a circuit to test it, the pilots that go into the car, they wear helmets, they wear uh, special suits that protect them from anything that could happen and mm -hmm. and, the, and gloves and everything. And, and, and then when the car is well proven, then, then all the normal people go. This is... This is pretty standard practice or has been pretty standard practice in new vehicle development. It's crazy to me to see that the FAA in America is not requiring that. Like we've seen Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic flying without pressure suits uh, happily. The, the norms are extremely easy in the US, not so much in Europe, so that the companies can do whatever they want. I think that's because <laughs> our government is so slow to react to anything. And this is all so new. When, anytime we see a venture into a new space, it's like anything goes and then eventually the government catches up, but it takes years and years and years to regulate it. So maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing, but uh, we'll see. I got to imagine your level of liability is, is through the roof, you know, not to use the, uh, a, a oh, bad well, pun that, here, but... No, that's one of the reasons why we are, we are based here in Spain instead of the US. Like I study in the US, I have family there. A lot of, it's a lot easier, obviously, to raise capital over there. But I, I've spoken to a lot of people, uh, experts in law and such, and many industries have really not progressed or been stunted at birth uh, in, in the U.S. Mm. Like, in the, for example, hot air balloons, it's a different kind of balloon, but the U.S. used to be the leader in making hot air balloons. Now, there's almost no production of those. They're mostly made in the U.K. and, and in Spain, and a bit in Turkey, um, I think Czech Republic as well. The thing is... Um, the U.S. has unlimited liability for these kinds of things. A judge can basically override any agreement. They can just set up any sort of liability. And that, especially if you're flying extremely wealthy people, it's incredible risk. Yeah. Most countries in the world are not like that. Like if you're flying in Mexico or you're flying in Canada even or you're flying in Spain, it's all manageable. 
So the liability risk that you need to compound in your business in the U.S. is almost as expensive as the project itself. And that is only true for America. Like, it's not true anywhere else. So I think having a business, like, I would not open up a base in the U.S., period. It doesn't make sense because of this liability. But anywhere else in the world, in Mexico, go for it. Yeah, so uh, we could get into a whole episode on the U.S. court system. <laughs> Let's it's just move just on because you, I think I think everyone's yeah. aware, you know, anyone could sue anybody at any time for any reason. Uh, it's insane. <laughs> yeah, it's very litigious and, and you know, you're not even covered. So, yeah, it just, it just doesn't make sense for such, this kind of activity to, to be done uh, there. Uh, it's just that it so happens that a lot of the early companies and a lot of the billionaires are American, but that's just a distortion in the force field. Once yeah. space tourism is really something that, that is like a $10 billion a year market or something, there are going to be uh, space ports and operations all around the world. Perfect. So let's jump into the actual experience and then we'll talk about the investment after that. When you're ready to go, uh, do you have a rough price of how much uh, one ticket will cost? And then what do you get with that ticket? So the restorations that we have so far are 100 and 10,000 euro per person. Uh, we expect the price to rise very significantly once we fly our first human because basically the demand will be higher and the offer is the same. So the experience in, in includes uh, a couple of days of training before the flight. We want people to be well rested, to understand the few things like if we have to avoid the flight meet way what you need to do there are two pilots on board so it's very easy and there's everything's very redundant but at the same time uh, we want to make it exciting a, a little bit like a rite of passage yep. so you learn about the atmosphere you learn about the materials that the vehicle is made of uh, the phenomena that are going to happen along the way so feel like you are you can't see an astronaut because astronaut is a profession and it's a huge dedication that you need but but it's like a mini sort of a space camp uh, VIP that, that you get um, before flying. And also the reason, also one thing, this is a very practical reason, but you don't want somebody coming from Ibiza with a hangover and <laughs> putting up on your thing and flying. It doesn't matter how wealthy they are. That's a recipe for trouble. I was just going to ask you, I feel like maybe you need them to like stay nearby where you can monitor them for a day or two. You know, you Correct. can't go out to the club the night before. <laughs> control the diet, control the, the substances. Uh, you know, you want to be at your prime, having slept well and everything. There is even a, a short period of microgravity when you separate from the balloon. So you take off very early in the morning, sometimes even pre-dawn, you go up because that's the best time to, to launch these kind of balloons. And also it's more spectacular because seeing the sun coming out uh, when from up there and just leaving the, the sky is black before the sun comes out and it stays black when the sun comes out and that's crazy. And, and then seeing the illuminated uh, layer of the atmosphere, like like the blue thin layer, it's, it's amazing. So, so it takes up like a couple of hours, two and a half hours to reach cruising altitude. Then you stay there about two hours, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on the winds, because every flight is different. Mm -hmm. you, this is not an A to B flight. This is an A to the edge of space, and then you land on a safe place. But that safe place, one day maybe a potato field, one day maybe uh, just a flat piece of land uh it's just going to be different every time very much like it's with conventional uh harder ballooning that you don't land on the on the same location every time and and the descent is done not with a balloon attached but with a very large parachute that can be guided and there are backup parachutes on top so you said a couple hours to get up there how long are you staying i guess at the at the peak height before you're dropping down yeah, just, uh, yeah. An, an average, an average, an average of two hours, and it takes less than half an hour to get down. So that th I think that's another huge selling point. I was just looking while you were speaking. I was just looking up how long the a Blue Origin flight is. It's eleven minutes. So <laughs> yes, and, but the, 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 that's a good good point. But the critical point is not the eleven minutes because you may compare, let's say, with Virgin and say, oh, Virgin is uh, I don't know one hour flight mm -hmm. yes but what the time that matters the, is the time that you see this view that right. you, this because as you're flying up initially it looks like an airplane or a helicopter and you're used to that you're not paying anything for that you're paying for the black sky so the black sky time on virgin is four minutes yeah i heard it was really quick and i was like that's it, it uh, <laughs> 
Uh, the black sky time on Blue Origin is a little bit better because it flies higher and it's just physics. It's the parabola that you're flying. It's five minutes. And yeah. our black sky time is over two hours. That's that. I think that's your selling point right there. That's. I mean, I'm just thinking of uh, from the uh, vain American standpoint. That's barely enough time for me to get a good selfie out in five minutes. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I mean, some people may be able to do everything they want to do in five minutes, but most need more, you know? No, yeah. More. I mean, and and I feel like your pricing is pretty comparable to them, uh, at least what you're planning, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. But or costing is not. <laughs> sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite familiar with, with rocket costing. I worked on the Ariane 5 rocket from, you know, the European launcher. And of course, I have many friends in all these companies and I'm pretty familiar. I mean, the... The costs of those flights are incredibly high, even for weekly flights, which they are not having. I mean, they're having a, one flight every, I don't know, six months or mm -hmm. a year. Even if you do weekly flights, your costs are insane. And for this, so unless they get to a point where they are doing, I don't know, they have a fleet of so many and they're flying every, every vehicle every day or something like that, it just doesn't work from a cash flow perspective. I mean, it's a very smart thing that was done by Blue Origin was auctioning the flight. Oh, right. Yeah. Because to be honest, they have so few flight opportunities and they're so different. Like it's not the same thing to fly with, with Captain Kirk or to just fly with some wealth uh, manager or some uh, hedge fund manager or something. Not the same. Oh, exactly. I'd rather fly with William Shatner than <laughs> some random rich guy from Wall Street. And the, the, the demand is so through the roof that when you do an auction and you have a credible system, and that's the thing. The system is credible, it's flown many times, just like SpaceX, just like the Russians. That's it. We're not credible in that sense because we still haven't flown people. Nobody else is. So when you're credible like that, you can command a price in an auction that is going to be above $10 million. And I, th I think that gives you a good idea of what the market can handle too and what the demand is yes. at, at that time. Let's talk about the investment Correct. side of it. Um, first of all, in your deck, I don't think I received it, but Sam, my co-host, did get to take a look at it. And it said that you've generated about $2 million in revenue. How have you done that so far? So we've, uh, we've monetized our capability to launch things. So for example, when Airbus has a new kind of spy camera for their high altitude drones, they give it to us and we test it on that pace of the bills. Or if somebody has a new kind of solar panel or they want to test an entire satellite, but they don't want to test it in orbit because they can't get it back and it's very, very expensive. We test it in space-like environment and, and that's enough. Uh, so there's even some marketing things. I mean, we flew a Barbie for Mattel and you could test it on live streaming system and they paid for it. So oh, very there cool. are marketing opportunities, there's research and development, scientific opportunities. There's lots of things that you can fly. And eventually one day we will have these kinds of balloons, uh, let's say monitoring borders. Like, for example, in Europe, we have a big problem with the Mediterranean between Africa and Europe, and people drown, and there's uh, drug traffic and environmental tragedies with folks uh, dumping stuff in the sea that they shouldn't be doing. Or It's it's a mess, and people trafficking, it's, it's really a mess. And there is no way to monitor this cost-effectively but from high altitude platforms. It may be balloons, it may be drones, maybe some combination, but from satellites, and when you look at the number of satellites, you need like 20,000 satellites or something like this. Nobody's gonna pay for it. When you look at drones, you need even more. You need like hundreds of thousands of drones. Nobody's gonna pay for that. So, so the mafia still do it and it's a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, balloons would cost effectively solve the problem if they were say launched, at least for the, for the Western part of the Mediterranean, if they were launched from Italy, and recovered in Spain, and they did some maneuvering up and down to, to stay longer there, we could cover that area very cost-effectively and have 24-7 eyes. It's an example. And th that revenue doesn't require flying people. It's already based on an existing capability. The, part, the hard part is convincing the governments to, to pay, a, a pay attention to the border, which seems to be something very difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's a, more of a political issue, I think. I think everyone agrees that you know I mean, or, uh, you need borders, but it, it's at least here in America, it's yeah. just a, it's a political fight. So yeah, obviously the borders in Ukraine matter more than your own borders. Right, yeah. So that's <laughs> 
Yeah. One question I actually have on that note, I guess, is you had mentioned you could use it for monitoring and kind of going back to that Chinese balloon that was in the sky for multiple days. Now you said, you know, a drone would not be effective in that because as far as I know, you can't fly a drone for days on end. How long? Yes, you can. Yes, you you can. can. Okay, sorry. You you can, but only one drone, which is this, uh, they're our customers. Airbus makes a a drone that used to be called Zephyr, now it's called Alto, that can fly for months. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. So I I guess that's why I was wondering, how long could one of your balloons stay in flight without, uh, I guess, essentially being refueled with helium? Um, How long could it it stay up? There have been balloons staying up, uh, not from ours, but similar technologies for over a year. Wow. Okay. Now it's starting to make sense here. Um, we have technology in the pipeline and access to it. I Again, I have to distinguish from all the stuff that I said so far are things that are brick and mortar that we could do right away. Yep. This would require some R&D, but we, I believe that balloons that can't stay for three, even up to five years are feasible with technologies that are right now on the lab that we are aware of but that would need to be tested, flight tested, and that would require some some R and D investment. And of course, I'm obsessed with capital efficiency. I'm putting capital into R and D. Doesn't look very efficient to me at this stage, until you're really making making positive cash flow. That's really interesting. I would have never guessed that one could uh, stay in flight for that long. Now, you, your site mentions yeah. that small satellites can be great investments. It wasn't really elaborated on, though. So I'm just curious, um, what type of return on an, a satellite, a small satellite would you see? And how, how would you even invest in a small satellite? There are a couple of problems that we, we try to solve in the Earth and that end up being very big markets. One is connectivity, and the other one is observing the planet. So getting up to the imagery of what's going on and also providing connectivity through to, to cell phones or to small internet of things devices or what have you or so those things traditionally have been done with big satellites but now that we all have a i mean we, we are all exposed to the potential of microelectronics let's say i'm taking this call with an iphone and it has incredible cameras and and processing capability and all this. So imagine you put you hook up some solar panels to this and you make it orient itself, and that's almost a satellite. We all got, a, we all have a satellite in our pocket in a mm-hmm. way. So small satellites can do a, a lot because electronics have shrunk so much, and also shrunk in size and in weight, and especially in cost. The thing is that most of the small satellites that are now being sent into space are like student projects. Sure. <laughs> they are something called CubeSats, and they have been designed to teach students, but they, have, they are not nearly optimized to, to the, for the mission. They are a lot heavier than they need to be. Their components are pretty heavy and very sturdy. And the reason why these satellites are not really yet extracting as much juice of the market as they could is because they are basically launched on conventional rockets. Mm-hmm. You see, if your satellite needs to withstand the ride on a missile, it needs to be very sturdy. And let's say it has solar panels that expand. Those solar, the mechanism for those solar panels needs to be very good and and it, and has to survive the launch and then work perfectly in space. There are lots of things like that. Or let's say you you want high resolution pictures. It's very easy to understand. It would be really cool that when you go to Google Earth, you could stay in an area and, and you say, take a picture in the next 15 minutes. Boom, you got your picture. That's only going to happen from, from from the whole world, from, from many small satellites or high altitude uh, devices could do that too. But let's say let's talk satellites but for for this high resolution you need a very large mirror for the telescope to work okay and um, the mirror would break on a conventional launcher so we need to invest in ways of launching things that work on the ground let's say a mirror or some device or so very thin solar panels to get those things up into orbit without breaking them and that's why that's what our patent helps with so we've patented an efficient way of launching things that would break on missiles but launching them into orbit so they they become satellites they spin the earth but the ride is smooth and the tough ride 
to orbit is the atmospheric phase. It's when you are trying to combine going really, really fast to getting out of the atmosphere. And, you know, when you're trying to do two very difficult things at the same time with the same hardware, that's tricky. Mm -hmm. And the two difficult things are getting out of the air and picking up crazy speed. If you solve the problem by breaking it into two simple and affordable problems, let's say, okay, first I float out of the air. And when I'm done with that, when I'm above most of the air, that's when I pick up speed. Well, guess what? Your engines are cheaper. The ride is smoother. You can fly things that are, as I said, fragile, but very, very effective in space. Once you are in space, you don't wait. You don't feel any weight. So imagine you could build a mirror that was extremely thin, you know, and very big. And would shatter uh, here, but if it, if the ride is kind of smooth, it can be it can be assembled or it can be put into orbit effectively. So that's interesting. So I guess something that's that's very fragile on Earth would uh, would be a lot more durable out in space. Correct. Yes, but we don't do that because our way to go to space is crazy violent. Be again, this is for the same reason as before, because these are systems that are designed to carry a nuclear warhead. And mm -hmm. guess what? The re-entry back into Moscow or Washington DC is even more violent right. than the right <laughs> up. So if, the, if they're designed, the, I don't know if you've seen a nuclear warhead, but they are like the most sturdy, compact thing, object you can imagine. It's extremely dense, extremely hard, and made to, to withstand crazy pressures and vibrations and all yeah because you don't you don't want that thing going off <laughs> at the wrong time <laughs> exactly so 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 they never care about making the ride up smooth and nice only when you're taking people you say okay we don't want to have too many g-forces you don't want to splatter the brains of the astronaut but again we're pretty sturdy ourselves there are things that are more they're more fragile on our bodies so that that's where our satellite launcher which we call blue star it's going to make a, a big difference because it will fly, of course, uh, with no emissions in the atmosphere because it ignites the rockets when, once it's outside of most of the atmosphere. So no EPA, no Environmental Project Agency, uh, sorry, Pro Protection Agency requirements because it's a, a balloon on the way up. And then once you're outside, that's when you light up the rockets. And um, the ride, as I said, is very, very smooth. Yeah, so this is this is a win-win, I think. I mean, if you tell me I, I need something delivered, you're telling me the ride is a lot smoother, we're going to take care of, of your fragile items, and secondly, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be cheaper, and there's not going to be an environmental effect, so you can actually scale it, and it's going to be on demand. You see, when, when, you're, when you have a, a new satellite idea, I'll say you just make a startup and you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to grow crystals in space, or I'm going to, I don't know, provide connectivity to cobalt mines so we can track what's going on there, whatever, there's so many applications. Uh, you have your little satellite, and now how do you launch it? Well, right now your options are never very good because <laughs> if you go to, say, um, in Russia, uh, well, uh, they are give, making you a favor to launch your thing, but their main priority is launching their military satellites because that's what they're concerned with. If you go to Elon Musk and say, oh, I will, SpaceX, can you launch my satellite? Yeah, they, they provide great service. They have uh, some rights, but the, the priority is going to Mars. Mm -hmm. the pri and the second priority is pleasing the U.S. government that has provided 99% of the funds. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so, so you are never the customer. You see, uh, the customer is Musk or DOD or Putin or Xi in China. Even you say, oh, well, there's Rocket Lab. Rocket Lab is a super cool company that started in New Zealand, but had to become American to get funded. So now Rocket Lab, the customer is obviously the DOD. <laughs> no, no, uh, so you are so all the all the systems. And when you launch with the Ariane Five, the, the European launcher, the customer is France, and it's a French project. And if anybody else launches something, it's a favor. They're doing you a favor. Okay, they, okay, we let you fly your little thing here, but don't bother. I think there is truly a demand in the world for a commercial launcher, truly commercial, where the customer is king. That doesn't exist. That doesn't exist anywhere. And that is an opportunity for others, not just ourselves, but somebody who's going to make it, but it doesn't exist. So a really quick question too, that we had from a listener that I forgot to mention. Um, it, sparked, it sparked when you were speaking. They had asked, um, why can't Chinese people be serviced by US companies? I, I'm not sure of the reference of that, but I, it looks like you probably do. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the US has a very particular uh, export control regime. 
And there are a set of laws called ITAR, International Traffic in Arms Regulations, that put some countries that are under arms embargo uh, with, uh, with some limits. So just like uh, there are many, many limits of many kinds, there is one that if a company is making a system that flies above control their space, so above 60,000 feet, uh, no Chinese citizen can get in touch with, um, I mean, can't touch or get close to that vehicle. Interesting. Or, to pro- or can talk to professionals working in that company. There's very, very stringent limits like that. And that is the reason why, for example, Virgin Galactic, that has been the one that has done the most marketing and sales, and they've sold uh, a total of about 1,000 tickets. They've sent back the money for maybe 300. So they have like a backlog of maybe 700 in my estimate. Of those thousands that they've sold, none of them has been sold to a Chinese citizen because it's illegal and it will be a federal crime. Uh, and uh, you see, this this is also one of the reasons why the U.S. is not exactly the best place to develop these things because it's very, very isolated. You're missing out on a, a huge market. <laughs> yeah, exactly. China is a huge market. When you look at Bentley cars or Louis Vuitton bags or anything high-end, oh my God, so many, I mean, China is blows blows it out of the park. I think I think Cadillac to put it in reference um, in General Motors, they said they sell more just in China alone than the entire world of their Cadillac division, which is essentially a, an American classic brand. And I think they sell like five to one in China. <laughs> yeah, and the highest, also the highest you go in in luxury, like you say, okay, Bugatti or you know higher up. Yeah, the more that the share of, of the Chinese market and a lot of people say, oh, well, the Chinese will want to fly with their own Chinese copy of what you're doing. No, <laughs> we don't see that. We don't see that. At they just all. want to go to space. <laughs> exactly. And also they they are extremely like it's it's us in the West that are obsessed with price. These people are obsessed with authenticity. They are obsessed with uh, storytelling. They want the original. They don't want the Chinese knockoff. Like if somebody sets up a shop in Shenzhen making replicas of uh, Lamborghinis, Lamborghinis, uh, maybe they'll sell a few, but I'm guessing most of the buyers are going to be Westerners that go there because they want to fake Lamborghini. But the yeah, actual yeah. wealthy Chinese, they can't care less for that. They want the real thing and they want to come to Italy and talk to the engineers and get the thing. So it's going to be the same for this kind of experience, uh, of course. On that note, is there any restriction for you being in Spain or the EU to any market in, of the world? No. And if they set it up, we probably move. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about your investment. You've raised about $6 million so far, I've heard. And how much are you looking to raise? And what's the timelines for these raise amounts? So yeah, we, in the whole life of the company, we've raised about $6 million. We've had a, about $2 million in sales. Those are the numbers. Unfortunately, all of our attempts to structure those fundraises have been unsuccessful. And uh, But we keep at it. And I would like to raise at least two and a half million, ideally three or five, something like that, to to get to the level when we fly first human safely. So, of course, it's going to require some more sales or investment. It's going to require some more funds to send tourists. But we believe that once we fly first human, we're good to go. I mean, we become much more attractive for, for example, sovereign way of funds that want to have a space tourism base in the country. And they've been talking to us for over 10 years and they're like, okay, the moment you fly first human, call us, no worries, let's set up a base. But before that, you need to figure out how to do it on your own. And and that's really what we would be requiring to get to that step. So that number doesn't sound extreme. Is, is that your main pushback? Is that you haven't flown an actual human yet that you're hearing from potential investors? For, for a lot of the investors, it is. What some investors also come with the, with the following. They say, oh, but yeah, you look like a platform, but you really need to decide if you're launching satellites or if you're launching people because these are very, very different markets and you need to focus. And we've done that. I mean, we're focusing first on what we can do, which is flying things. And we have turnover from that. So we show we can perform as a sales organization and, and, and ship. But the next step that makes the most sense is flying the humans because it's really 
crazy the, um, the, the difference between demand and offer. So you can charge so much uh, and you can fund basically anything that you want from that step. I mean, once we've flown a few hundred billionaires around the world, it's peanuts to fund the satellite launcher that actually requires more capital. But a lot of people are put off by the variety of the, of the applications and they tend to think that focus is the main thing for an entrepreneur. And I agree that while you're doing something, you're going to be very, very focused on it. But that doesn't mean that what you're doing is not useful for, for many, many things. Imagine if Amazon had only sold books. Right. <laughs> it wouldn't be worth what it is. You see, the company is not called zero to 36 kilometers. It's called zero to infinity because there's so much potential up there. But right now, I think the low hanging fruit is getting to that human space flight market that is so much in demand and that the solutions right now are absolutely dismal in comparison. So I, I really enjoy both sides of the business. Obviously, from a personal standpoint, it'd be, it'd be fantastic to go to space. But I also see the value in launching other satellites for these companies and how much more efficient that market could be. So I hope that people uh, listening to this podcast will maybe understand that as well and uh, gets you some funding. Where can people go to to learn more about the company, uh, check out the investment deck, um, things of that matter? Where w- would you like to send people? They can look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, they look for Jose Lopez Urdiales uh, in, at Zero to Infinity. They can write to me directly on LinkedIn. They can also reach out via Twitter, where we, I am J-M-L-U-77. Uh, there's also a Twitter account of the company that is relatively active. There's even an Instagram. It's not that active, but they can reach out through that if that's what they like. We'd be happy to, to talk to them and see also if they want to send some something up there. We can help them out with that. Or yeah, where that that those all those ways work to to connect with us. Great, and for all the bosses out there listening, you can check out all those links in the show notes. I'll put every single one of them that Jose mentioned, and I'm really excited to hear where this goes. I think in your two year timeline. I hope that we have someone out in space on a balloon. Thanks for your time, Jose. Absolutely. To infinity and beyond. Wow. Okay. Derek, first thing that I want to ask you about, a little thought experiment. All right. Go for it. You go into space. You actually sound quite quite interested going to space. So I'm, I'm taking it this is something that you would one way or the other, one form or the other, you'd be actually interested in going to space? Yeah, I think I think I said it on there. I'm interested to go to space, check it out, see what it looks like, have the experience. But as far as going to the moon, going to Mars, I don't have any I don't have any interest in that. Okay, so so you're so you're signing up to go. Now, the question becomes, would you rather take the leisurely route, in which case you're committing to a 6-hour flight in a hot air balloon up to space, or would you rather be strapped to a rocket and have that kind of adrenaline-filled fast action up and and uh, and down. We, we saw Bezos go up in it, right? So, like, would you rather have that experience, or would you rather take the the leisurely luxury route? Well, I didn't even know that the leisurely luxury route was an option until three days ago, <laughs> and uh, it, there's no comparison. It's it's like you know, you're not on a schedule. This is your vacation. This is an experience. It's like telling me, do I want to take the train in Europe or somewhere that actually has functioning trains outside the U.S to a city or do I want to get on a cramped airplane? I'm going to take the train all day. Okay. So I, th- I think most people would probably agree with that, especially when they see these pods. I mean, you're going up in what looks to me, it's like, it's like a nice hotel room, about the same, same size, maybe a little smaller, but mm-hmm. you know, very modern, very comfortable looking, right? Plush. I have a different view. Really? Okay. You're up yeah. there for hours. I think that's cool. The other one, what do you say? Like Virgin Galactic is like six minutes or five minutes. Like what? Okay. Well, <laughs> we saw Bezos. We saw Bezos's thing. That that, that couldn't have lasted more than I think 10 it, minutes. Right? Yeah, I think it was like ten or fifteen minutes at the most. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's pure. It's pure adrenaline from what it looks like. So for me, it's a bit different. I wouldn't be drawn to the adrenaline. I wouldn't be drawn to it at all. I don't want to go to space. I'm a land animal. I don't like heights. You're you're the adventure guy, Sam. Why? Yeah, but that this stuff is never this this has never appealed to me. Even since I was like a kid, I'm like I would never go to space. I never really enjoyed flying. I never wanted to be like I wasn't the kid that wanted to be like an astronaut, but 
I always thought it was cool to just be like, what's up there? Even though this is like a weird conspiracy theory thing and I do not buy into it at all, but it's, it's something that we've never actually seen with your, you know how you want to see something with your own eyes? Like, here's an example. Mm -hmm. I went a few years ago for the first time, went to the Grand Canyon. I've seen the Grand Canyon a thousand times on video, mm -hmm. on photos, whatever it may be. But when I got there, I was like, holy crap, this is like way more amazing than I ever would have thought. And I feel like I would have that same experience going to space. I, I think I think everyone would. I think it's actually really good for the world because it would just expand everyone's horizons to, to a, a, a level that you couldn't even fathom, right? Yeah. It's like you, you see these photos from James Webb, but it's cool. But you actually get up there and you, you see the earth from a, like really above – and you start seeing like the, just the expanse of the universe and start thinking like, what is it? You know, you start, you start wondering more in that, that sense of like being a kid and that, that wonder and that joy of wondering about the nature of things I think comes back. But for, for me, I, everything changed on the adrenaline front when I started getting panic and now I don't really do the adrenaline things anymore. And the, the thought of being suspended in a balloon, Oh, like you can't get uh, out however many kilometers above and you can't get out, you're stuck, you know? So I would actually, okay, if I had to now, do this, this is starting to make sense. If now. I had to do this, I would take the rocket option. Cause it's like, all right, I can do anything for 15 minutes if I have to. Right. And it's, a, there's less anxiety going into it on the way there. You're up there on the way back. You're like, it's like less than an hour. It's like taking an easy flight. <laughs> okay. That's starting to make more sense now. Yeah. 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 But, but that's just me. You know, um, I think if you stack these up on paper, and we, we can go through kind of the spreadsheet. This wins in basically every way, right? Comfort, experience. Like when I talked to Jose the first time, he's like, you can do whatever you want up there. You can make Mile High Club. You can drink champagne. He, he said that to me too. Yeah. And I was like, there's <laughs> pilots in there. Like, what are you? <laughs> do you really want to be the pilot and people are having sex behind you <laughs> in space? It's <laughs> <laughs> like, guys, just make it quick and quiet, right? please. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Before we jump into like the business aspect, because I, I think it's awesome too. And I even warned him after we got off the call. I was like, Oh, this is another one of those ones where it's going to be me and Sam and we really want to invest in it, <laughs> but mm -hmm. we'll talk about it in a minute. Have you ever f gone in a hot air balloon, Sam? I have. Yeah. When I was younger. I haven't. And I actually got gifted one for my birthday, but the weather huh. has been such shit in California that I haven't been able to use it yet. So I'm just curious, I guess, I don't know. I, what was that like? I mean, obviously it's not the same thing, but... I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm really excited to do it. I've never done it before, but you know, it's, it's just like, I kind of get your, your trap thing now though, too. Cause you're just, you're in a little basket and if, like, I know there's like no chance of falling out, but in my head now late, I don't know, maybe cause I'm getting older. I'm like, what if I fell out? What if, I, <laughs> what if this happened? There's, there's definitely a chance of falling out. <laughs> you're not, you're not wearing a seatbelt in that hot air balloon. No, it's, it's cool. I mean, I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's fine. Like it's good to experience. I'm not ever craving to go up in a hot air balloon again. I mean, it's just, you just see a bit of an aerial view of wherever you're at. Sure. But we've all flown in an airplane and seen a that. thousand yeah. times at this point. So <laughs> we've seen, we've seen what the world looks like from, uh, you know, a thousand feet up. Okay. Then why, why do you think no one else had thought of this balloon idea before them? Cause he said the first people that really went the highest were these hot air balloons way before we even had airplanes. I don't know. I mean, people have gone very high in hot air balloons before. Right. And it is, it is a tourism activity globally. There's hot air balloons going up every day all over the world. They just haven't gone up this high. They haven't gone up to the edge of space before. There's been one that's gone up really high, like probably arguably to the edge of space, but not as high as, as they're aiming to go to where actually you feel like you're, you're, on, you're in space or at the edge of space. You know, there, there's obviously reasons that they haven't gone that high before, largely safety. Well, he did mention the technology. Uh... The uh, the Red Bull Stratos one that was the one um, that went a hundred and twenty seven thousand feet in the air, mm -hmm. about twenty four and a half miles. So that was, I think that's the highest balloon. That was. Do you remember that, Sam? There was like a guy in a spacesuit that jumped out from the top. Yeah, and actually, that was the that was the last thing that mankind did that I was like inspired. Yeah, that and was I pretty cool. I remember watching that on TV, going, "This is the answer to like." the world's problems we need we need big ambitious like joint projects like this again 
But that's where this private capital comes in because the world's different now. In the 60s, the government spend on NASA, and I'm sure the Soviet Union was the same way, it was just incredible. Like, There's no way we could justify doing that anymore because mm-hmm. the world is just different. And we have, you know, we have Silicon Valley, we have all these private tech companies, and that's those are the people that we need to rely on now to really innovate. And we have, re- it, look at all other innovations in the last 30 years. 40 years, and they haven't come from the government. Yeah. It's come from a uh, private business. Yeah. And we, and to a degree, like it's not always healthy anymore to have governments and countries competing against each other in this way. Right. It just draws like <laughs> this, this nationalistic theme, which is, you know, causing, causing major, major rifts in the world right now. But things like the international space station, you know, like that's all, aw- that's awesome. Right. And that was like, that was a joint project, but that Red Bull, thing i mean that and also the um the blue horizon thing with bezos i thought both of those things were like incredible but actually this technology is like going to the moon was way more incredible right in comparison and that was just the fact that it happened 60 years ago yeah (laughs) like we didn't even have a a freaking computer like like no like a Mm -hmm. like an average person did not have a computer (laughs) the technology you know what's weird that our iphone has better technology than the 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 rocket that went to the moon yeah, it's wild, right? And just the, the bravery of those astronauts back then. I don't know if you've ever seen a, uh, a video of like Russia's. Russia was the first to do a spacewalk. Mm-hmm. Like that, if you just sit down and think about a spacewalk for a second, like actually think about it, that is just so crazy. Yeah, you just like you're you, out in this, this black void. You have theories of what could happen, but you don't know for sure until you do yeah. it. <laughs> and there's just, there's just limitless expanse in any direction that you look right no no humans ever had that experience like you look left you look right you, you look at a wall <laughs> you look at a car <laughs> you look at a, 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 if you're in san francisco you're looking at, at a, a tent community yeah right <laughs> uh, if you're in bangkok you're looking at buildings small but like you never have an unlimited expanse you look up you see the sky but you can't see but like if you're in space just see out forever like i don't that feeling must be so wild and then to get out of like the comfort of your little space shuttle into that expanse and look down at the earth which is just like a blue dot in the sky at that point man those guys had some serious nuts yeah totally (laughs) still do still do but imagine the first guy to do it i don't know i i think it's cool but i i feel like by the time that i could actually afford it it's like oh so many people have been there already it's like whatever it's like the the trendy thing to do by the time you do it you know might be a bit 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 anticlimactic but no i think this is awesome so you have a you have an overall comparable spreadsheet i think that you've been able to pull up we should touch on that real quick and talk about how this this differentiates from like the virgin galactic spacex blue horizons of the world i guess price wise let's let's talk about the uh, the competitors he's got on on this list this is the deck from zero to infinity there's something called a space perspectives neptune worldviews explorer zef alto which I believe is another balloon one as well. And um, Virgin Galactic's spaceship, as we've mentioned, Blue Origin's uh, New Shepard rocket, and then SpaceX's Dragon F9 rocket. All of those, uh, I should say, except for SpaceX's, are just the short trips within you know less than a day. The actual SpaceX Dragon F9 is a 10-day trip. That's like a, like a whole <laughs> vacation. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lengthy cruise. Yeah. <laughs> My gosh, ten day trip! You need some serious, serious psychological preparation, yeah, and vetting before <laughs> they admit you to do that. Ten days in outer space. Zero to infinity. He had mentioned uh, about one hundred ten thousand euros, essentially. Let's say one hundred to one hundred fifty thousand US. And then, how does that compare to the the rockets? I was I was shocked to see the pricing. I think I had heard these before, but just to confirm, Blue Origin is an auction based pricing system at, at the moment. With the and I don't think they actually disclose who wins the auction or how much they pay for, during the auction, but rumors are that those tickets are going for fifteen to twenty million. If you want the Jeff Bezos experience, fifteen to twenty million per pop. Then you have SpaceX, which again, longer duration, multiple days in outer space, but that right now is fifty-five mil. That's a big ticket. And then I think the one people are probably more familiar with, Virgin Galactic. They were pre-selling tickets at four hundred and fifty thousand, but that is not—that's not the same experience as like the Blue Horizon. And also, I've heard recently that 
they're not even planning on continuing because they've had so many issues. And also I think they've had some deaths that they're talking about not even continuing the program. So that might not even be a, a viable business anymore. I think Virgin Galactic is just kind of like a really, really high flight. Yeah. And zero to infinity would be a, a really, really high air balloon. <laughs> but that, it would last so much longer. And, Luxury. Oh, one of their pilots did die in Virgin Galactic, unfortunately. Yeah, mm. they, they did have a death. As the safety aspect, though, for one, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that there's thousands of gallons of flammable gas behind you in a rocket. Yeah. And uh, helium is not flammable. So, I mean, right right off the bat right there, I feel like the safety aspect feels a little better right there. Yeah. And those things, unfortunately, do explode, uh, as we've seen sometimes in, in at least NASA's history. I'm sure pretty much the history of everyone else that's ever tried to fly, fly a rocket. But one thing that I think will be a major, uh, major, you know, unique proposition to what Zero to Infinity is doing is the is the eco friendliness. So zero emissions compared to rocket fuel, which uh, there was some comparable about how much, like how bad one rocket, like one Falcon rocket, going up is. But as space tourism becomes a theme and 10, 20, 30 years, this for sure is something people are going to be talking about, right? And there's just absolutely no way that a rocket is going to go up with zero emissions. So if people, you know, want to want to support a, an eco-friendly way to do it, this seems to be the only way. And there's, there's helium and hydrogen, right? Like hydrogen's the one that you don't want to do. I think that's the one that's, that can blow up. That was the Hindenburg. Yeah. The famous one of the Hindenburg that could blow up. So they've Gosh. switched to helium since. Okay. I was just looking up carbon footprints. It said the average space rocket when it goes into space is about the equivalent of 100 flights on a, on a standard airplane, like a, like a 747. Oh so. <laughs> uh, luckily, there's not that many rockets going up. Right. But that's some serious jet fuel, some serious emissions. One thing we should bring up on this deck, too, is it's very interesting, the whole... Um, all these other companies are based in the US, uh, the bigger competitors at least. And Zero to Infinity is based in Spain. And basically, I mean, Jose's from there, but also strategically, they don't want to be in the US. They were not able to have Chinese fly on that, which I thought was interesting. You were cutting out, what, uh, one fifth of the world right off the bat? Yeah, you c Chinese cannot fly on your aircraft? One fifth of the world, but they probably, on a percentage basis, spend money more money on this type of stuff than anyone else it's like it's the same with like fine wine you know they just love to buy stuff for celebrations and um credentials and and things like this so that's got to be it'll probably be the biggest market in the world for for, for this type of tourism yeah, I found that very interesting that the the other U.S. companies are not able to accommodate them. So that even adds to it even more that they're like, we can't go on those. Which ones can we go on? Here's zero to infinity right there. Yeah, that was an interesting one. I was I was in, uh, I was caught off guard by realizing that these companies couldn't fly uh, Chinese nationals. So. We should also add, talk that Zero to Infinity is not just just a, a tourism company. They can also do the delivery aspect, which I thought was interesting too. They can deliver like yeah. especially fragile satellites into space. And that got me wondering how many satellites are actually in space flying around right now. Do you, Have you looked it up, Sam? Do you got an idea of how many satellites are up there? I have not. Did you, did you Google it or did you use ChatGPT? So <laughs> I should have used ChatGPT. That's a good point. Uh, we'll have to rely on. Oh, well, you got to remember, Chat G GPT is uh, is like two years old, so I, I guess mm -hmm. Google wins this Ooh, one. Good point. Um, as of December 2022, there were six thousand nine hundred and five satellites floating through space. So that's uh, well, it's a big space. We'll just say that <laughs> it is. Yeah. So I guess it's hard. It's hard to to wrap your head around that. But uh, in comparison, a year earlier in 2021 there was 6,500. So there was 400 more in one uh -huh. year. So there's a new one every single day at this rate. Wow. Yeah. One time I was on this, I was on a cruise that went down to Antarctica and we had, we had bought this, um, this device that could, would connect to, to in, uh, satellite internet, but we could only get it. We could only get internet like every, maybe for like five minutes, every hour and a half when a satellite was positioned oh, over us. Oh, when it came by. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. But it was cool because the device, you had a, you kind of had like this this graphic um, or digital map that would show the Earth, and it would show all the different satellites that were 
that were in orbit above Earth that you could connect to. And even just like those, they were everywhere. That's crazy. Like, yeah. Everywhere. You know, I was shot. And that was that was almost 10 years ago. So there's a lot of stuff up there, man. Yeah. But there's there's unlimited dimensions, right? It's like a road. If you're driving at ground level of the Earth, there's like there's just there's basically one one level or one dimension. But if you if you were to tunnel down into the Earth, you know, there's almost unlimited, right? And if you went up, there's almost unlimited because you're in, you know what I'm saying? I don't know yeah, if totally. dimension is the right word, but lanes, more lanes. More so. lanes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, back to the future. Like they started flying in, in, in the air instead yeah. cause it, to yeah, alleviate a lot, traffic. A lot of lanes. <laughs> a lot of lanes to choose from. So one thing that really excites me about Zero to Infinity is the upcoming milestones and also the capital required to get there. Like I'm not in a position that I... I could fund this, but if I, if I was, if, you know, I would be very interested to be part of this, or I'm sure you could be part of it for a smaller check amount as well, but they basically need what sounds like two and a half million dollars. Let's call it, let's call it $3 million to set the milestone, the big milestone. But isn't that way less than you thought? I, w I thought he was going to say like 20 million. Yeah. I mean, I think, but they, you have to think about, they've been doing this for more than 10 years. They've had 50 successful flights. They've raised more than $6 million so far. So it's been a long process to get to this point. Now it's just like, hey, we're here. We have the foundation. Like To do this flight is going to cost us $3 million in preparation and, and doing it. But it's, and it's like 12 months. And that here's what I think will happen. If you, if you get to that milestone, you have what will become unlimited press and media coverage, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone, pretty much every every country in the world this news will cover that well yeah they'd be smart to send a reporter up there to to document it or a couple of podcast hosts for the first podcast in space yeah you can go Derek. <laughs> <laughs> wear your parachute right <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you were able to, to uh, uh, let's think about this as an entrepreneur uh investor right if you if you hit that landmark or that milestone you have unlimited me global media coverage and from that You'll get, you'll generate definite investor demand. You'll, in, you'll generate government interest that, you know, on a commercial basis, but governments will also want to fly their own, their own people up there. Like, you know, the first Moroccan into space, the first, uh, Kazakhstani into space, things like this. Sure. Uh, and then, and you also have the customer demand. You just fly it successfully. You show this incredible like hotel room that you go up in the space in nice, leisurely six hour flight. People have photos with champagne and stuff up there. So all you like, I'm thinking about this is you hit that milestone, everything opens up for you as a company. So you have to do like whatever you got to do to get to that milestone. And if you're saying that's only three, 3 million bucks, I don't see how someone doesn't like just write a check for that or you go out and take, get bank debt or something because that that's the whole future of, of the the opportunity and the whole future of the company right there. That was my thought as well. That's why I thought that the number felt low. And according to his projections, there's, they're only unprofitable for a year, maybe two years before they start making profit after that. So it's it's yeah. obvious that the, the barrier to this is getting a human up there. And once you have one, it's just going to take off from there. For sure. So I, I mean, personally, I hope they're, I hope they're successful in doing this. Jose seems like a great guy. You know, I, I was able to talk to him one time before. And uh, next time I go to Barcelona, I'm definitely looking forward to going to, and meeting him in person. But uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be, I'm hoping, hopeful that this is something that will, you know, that will work because I think as a comparison to the other space tourism programs that are currently in place, like this just is, seems way better, and especially thinking about the, the earth and shifting things to, to sustainability. Like, this has to be the option that people use, not the rockets, because the rockets just aren't, they're not sustainable. So let's, let's make this the, the way that people get to space. Yeah, I completely agree. And thank you so much, Sam, for actually getting me in touch with Jose and just putting this out in front of everybody because it didn't even cross my mind that this would be an option. And, and now I'm really excited to, to learn about this. The whole, the whole rocket thing seemed seems cool but it's it's like we've seen it before it's like it's basically just a private version of nasa and this is like a second option that turns it more into leisure i don't know like a leisurely trip i, I know you said it wouldn't be for you but i think it would be for a lot of people yeah instead of making the mile high club you can make the what is it 60 miles high yeah 100 something miles like high? that <laughs> <laughs>
you could do a lot of other things too. I I don't understand how the I'm thinking of like in movies, they always talk about, oh, we're in international waters. We can do whatever we want to do. And I asked about the airspace and that's kind of the same thing. It's like international air. There's no laws essentially, <laughs> right? What, what do you, what do you want to do? I don't there? know. I was what like, you, what are you, what are you itching at? I was like, could you, you murder wanna... someone in space? <laughs> oh, okay. You're yeah. I was like, you really want to go to space to, to play blackjack? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I just, I, I got to really, I've been studying up my poker game, <laughs> but no. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm like, yeah. Who owns space? And he's like, no one really. Yeah. I guess for right now, the billionaires own it. Bezos, uh, Musk, and um, Branson. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I want to hear from the, the listeners, though, on that on that question that we started the outro with, which is, which would you prefer? Would you rather go up in the rocket and have that drill impact 15 minutes, or would you rather go uh, up leisurely style? I think it's a good question. My bet is that more people are going to choose the leisurely option, but not me. So <laughs> I want to hear from everybody else. Yeah, I'll put a poll up in Boss Lounge and in Patreon. Speaking of, you bosses out there have some work to do because it's been pretty quiet lately. You know, the markets turn, the economy is going a little crazy. I don't know if... Credit Suisse, SVP. Yeah, all this all this stuff going on, which should be, you know, the time for everyone to kind of tune in and catch up on the podcast and, and chime in and help each other out. But you guys are pretty quiet out there. So your task is... Either A, join our Patreon for $5 a month, or if you don't want to do that, it's totally fine. But if you do, there's a lot of cool extra bonus content you can get on there. Sam and I like to record some fun bonus episodes in there. We have a quarterly update coming up. You can do that at investlikeaboss.com. Click become a Patreon. And you don't have to pay. We're totally fine with that. But there is one fee we want you to do is leave a review or a comment on our social media um, if you listen on Spotify, give us five stars. You're not able to write a review, but at least if you could give five stars, all that helps right now, because, you know, as you're seeing in your own personal finances, the economy is changing. We're also seeing that with a, a lot of corporations and advertisers, and it's tougher out there. And the more that, that they see that we have a really interactive audience, we know you guys are out there. You're just a little shy lately. <laughs> if you could help us out and just uh, write those reviews and give us good ratings, that goes immensely helpful. I agree totally. And I know a lot of the Patreons, just our Patreons, to support the show, not necessarily interested in all the different benefits and perks that we have. And we really appreciate that, guys. And again, without you, we couldn't possibly keep the show going, especially not at, at the rate that we are. So even though times are a little bit more challenging and there's um, caution on the horizon with the global markets, we appreciate all of your support. Totally. And thank you to Jose as well for coming on the show. He actually said he wants to come back on when they get their first human out in space. So I hope that is sooner then later, definitely going to have to follow up with him on that. And hopefully he's one of the first ones out there as well. If you want to learn more about Zero to Infinity, though, I'll put all the links in the show notes or uh, give you access to, to speak to Jose directly because maybe if you want to invest, that's a possibility as well. Sounds great. All right, Derek. Great interview. I'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at bestlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.